I um, come from Nashville with HCA. If you're unfamiliar with HCA, it is, I believe, the largest healthcare hospital organization in the world. Uh, they have, I think, over 200 facilities in the U.S., um, most of them the larger metropolitan hospitals. Um, I started with them about a year and a half ago, basically to do data visualization um, and single page application development. And what I'm going to be showing is kind of some of the work we've been doing with D3 in uh, some of the I guess products we're building for internal use, uh, as well as just some different uh, libraries and just ideas that D3 has kind of built into it, because it has a lot of interesting design patterns that I wasn't familiar with or didn't really use much until I got into it, and it really changed how I felt about JavaScript, along with Node.js in general, with being able to set up like MUDs on Socket.io, which is incredibly fun. Um, I'm not really going to do a slide deck. I have one slide there. Um, this produces examples. If you have a laptop, you're welcome to follow along for some of this. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that's interesting about T3 is that it is somewhat, I guess, declarative and functional. It has some places where it deviates pretty strongly. But part of the core in the library is its use of the functor. It uses a very simple functor. If you're not familiar with functional programming, this is like a wrapper uh, around with an operation or piece of data. And in D3, to simplify the code base and do some kind of interesting things, what it does is pretty much most of the methods you deal with, you pass them functions. If you don't pass them a function, D3 calls this on it, on pretty much everything you give it, the functor, which says, if you are a function, we're going to return you. If you're not a function, you just became a function that returns whatever you gave me. So everything is a function. <laughs> um, there's a, like, some people, and I was just, this is kind of an aside, it's kind of a cool page I found when looking up better functors in JavaScript. Like, some functional languages will attempt to deal with the fact that if you do a lot of coding, if you have like null or undefined, and you try and perform an operation on it, you, you know, undefined is not a function, everything explodes, bad day. Um, so some languages try to make sure that that can't happen to you, either at compile time or the way you structure things at runtime. Um, what we've got here is, you know, it's trying to basically do some stuff where if I've got an item and if it really exists, I want to print the item, which is a, a pretty straightforward piece of code. But then you'll find data types in some functional languages that will be called like maybe. And these are basically functors in that they, they create like a wrapper around what you want to deal with so that it, it can be dealt with in a consistent way. And so like for this maybe, you can see what it's going to do is we, we pass something in and the item in this case, and we're actually going to return a, a new object that has a function that pretty much can wrap the item. And It'll basically allow us to, to chain things and make sure that if, it, if it's not going to work, nothing bad happens. Does anyone have any questions about the weirdness of this? It's just kind of a functional side. It's a pretty cool concept if you look it up. It, they, the guy in this article goes on to even like make more advanced versions where you can like pass in conditionals which would be like is defined, but you could make more complex ones like is greater than 10 or something, whatever not zero is necessary for your program. So the guy who writes D3, which I haven't shown you yet, is a guy named Mike Bostock. Bostock. He, uh, 
D3 is basically a data visualization library. It stands for data driven documents. And its basic concept is that you have a bunch of data over here, and you have a bunch of visual representations of data on the other side, and it joins them. Not quite like SQL, but more like a zipper. And the kind of cool thing about it is that it creates what it calls a selection, kind of like a jQuery selection, but dangerously not so. Um, and so if you have like an array on one side and nothing on the other side, and you combine them, what it'll do is it'll create placeholders for every visual item that's missing. Or if you have a bunch of visual items and no data, it'll create placeholders for your data. Um, so, so, that's probably jumping ahead. Um, so, Mike Bostock created this library. A lot of people had a lot of trouble using it. Um, so, he came up with a, uh, a general pattern for people to kind of create their own reusable code with it. And <clears throat> D3 is really fond of method chaining, like jQuery and some other stuff. So you can basically, you know, kind of at the top, you know, generate a chart and then set the width and the height. And to do that, like Phosphite recommends basically having a, a function that stores your, your actual like, variables that uh, We've got our set of variables that store the data as kind of implicit private variables in JavaScript. They get trapped in what's called a closure. And then a function that actually performs the actual chart building or whatever else kind of thing you want to do gets put here and returned as a reference. Um, but when that's returned, it captures the getters and setters right there. Um, so it's implicit private scope which is JavaScript, that's about the only way you can really get privacy. Um, now, this is D3, if you haven't taken a look, if you go to d3js.org, you will find just tons and tons and tons, literally thousands of examples. Um, and the code for a lot of these is mind-bogglingly small, like just it's, it's declarative instead of imperative, so a lot of the code's not actually going to say, uh, it, it says what we want to achieve instead of how we get there. Um, and it's really fun to play with, but when you start with it, at least for me, it was kind of like hitting a brick wall. Let me show you. So at my company, what we had was an issue where we have hundreds of hospitals and thousands of vendors. Um, and that can be like everything from you know, supply chain to financials to different medical companies about like x-rays that we've been operating with. And it turns out that they generate literally millions and millions of messages every day, back and forth, um, in this rather complicated web of stuff. And we needed to be able to find out, uh, well, first they wanted to actually start acting on this data, um, because the whole big data world has arrived, and we've got huge amounts of medical data and other data and they wanted to get into actually taking this data and trying to save people's lives and improve efficiencies and do myriad other things. But what they, uh, what they wanted to do first was a pilot project that involved blood sepsis. And if you haven't heard of sepsis, blood poisoning, about 30% of people that get it in the hospital will die. Um, so it kills many, many thousands of people in America every year. And so they brought in a lot of people who uh, uh, took the title of data scientist. And they started going through as much data as they could. And they came up with 
a bunch of possible rules as to like different factors that seem to, in the data, indicate that someone might be more or less likely to go septic. And they've, I guess, after just analyzing the data way after the fact, they've changed procedures and they've cut the number of people who are dying from that in HCA hospitals by about 12 or 1,300 a year, is the estimate. But now what they want to do is actually start acting proactively on it. So you'll actually have you know, medical devices hooked up to patients that are feeding into a central data center. You've got algorithms that have been trained to correlate a large number of conditions and just kind of like, you know, uh, immediately alert. And so that should send out an alert based on all this data to a nurse who's like, oh my gosh, this patient is in danger of going septic. And then they go try and stage an intervention before it happens. Um, they ran into a problem though because we didn't actually know if we were getting our data. We didn't know how much of our data we were getting. There are millions and millions of messages. Literally, I think 70,000 point to point connections that have been manually set up between places and have to be monitored for going down. That number is going up fast, especially as we start adding more and more machines. Um, and so we needed some kind of system that would actually watch all of the message flow that's going through our integration system and set up kind of a predictive analytics system. And when it noticed things dropping out and not appearing as they should, to, to go and to alert on those and to try and provide uh, also visualizations to audit all of our messages to find the ones we're not getting and to effectively provide a way for us to just see what's going on. So this is basically one of the first things we did, which was a component flow. And this is what's called a flow diagram in D3. You can look it up. There's what's called a Sankey, S-A-N-K-E-Y uh, plugin. And the, I wrote a custom version of the Sankey plugin that allowed me to kind of change things slightly, especially because might have to animate because the data is constantly changing and some of them are interactive. But uh, oops, we've got here over here are source systems, by people, meta tech. These are things where like doctors and nurses are actively entering raw data into clinical systems and hospitals. And so you could go down here and you could basically see you know, we've got 1.7 million messages, I guess, that's today, and for my people. And then I'm running this in demo mode, so I've got like fake names for everything. Normally, these would be things like nursing documents or pharmacy orders or radiology reports, but now they're mostly things like herbs. Um, so you can track pretty much the flow from <coughs> source systems through our integration engines. Cloverleaf is a large point-to-point -point messages must always be delivered integration system. This talk is an integration system that does XLST and allows us to do kind of complex document transforms to move data around. Uh, we actually have the largest BizTalk installation in the world um, that we're trying to monitor. Um, so eventually these things get dumped into kind of end systems, like we've got database motion, DB motion, which is uh, supposed to let us uh, provide feeds for uh, consumer level reporting. We've also got over here is TDs or Teradata, which is some mega enterprise warehouse database that I only know that it does batches and it's very sad. From my perspective, um, <laughs> it's not fun to deal with. Uh, so you can. We also like that's our component flow. We also have, say, a data flow visualization. Um, um, you can go into the data center that we're doing with cows, and like if we said real names, one of these would be ten the Tennessee Meditech market, and then we could drill down to see something. Uh, like uh, Centennial Medical Center in the end to actually watch its data. This, this is color-coded based on predictive analytics as to what we expect. 
purple's like more volume than we think we should get. Yellow would be under volume, and that's more worrisome usually. Red is generally a real bad sign. <laughs> Not mechanist is currently down. Okay. That's somebody's message type at some facility for an elephant. Um, so you can see here here little graphs, and so those are all just embedded D3 charts in the data grid. And stuff to play with, with the different alert systems. Um, uh, one of the most important things we were setting up uh, was we needed to reconcile our messages where we've got, this is, I guess, every day, last month or two, and there you can see this is the raw volume, it's not the number of point-to-point -point messages, it's just the number of messages that originate. So we've got kind of unique messages. So if we go like August 22nd, you know, that's five million messages that we're trying to make sure are getting through. And we've got different message types, probably nursing documents, and the have them broken down. Green is we like we went out and we looked at logs and we found it at its source and we found it all the way at its destination. Oh, sorry. That's another refresh that maybe put on. And it used to like not do that if you were interacting with it, but they didn't handle it. Which, so. <laughs> um, the uh, yellow means we've basically not been able to find records of it at the source. I think we actually had a major downtime in the last couple of days, which is why we've got all this yellow. It's kind of unusual. Um, red is the most disturbing one because those are messages we currently have been unable to reconcile. Like we find <coughs> evidence of these messages on the source systems where doctors are entering them in, and we don't have them in the warehouse. <coughs> so these are the, the messages that are lost or I guess they don't like the word lost. It's not, <laughs> not reconciled. <laughs> so, and, and, and sometimes we really, you know, there could be various reasons why this shows up as red. Some of it is because like IDs are not being translated properly and we're dealing with many, many, many systems. And so we've got some that like right now we're generally running at under a percent of the messages that we are not reconciling. We're expecting to get rid of a lot of that really soon when we finish uh, one last translation step. But this is, this is used for diagnosing a lot of the problems we have where people can kind of drill into things and be like, I want to look at you know, the, this by network, by data type, and then that's not very interesting. That's and then you can basically be like, let's break it down and see different error types, or look at latency in the messages, and you can see uh, or hot swap to different things like to get a great view, or you can even grab samples of the messages and download them. Um, there's other ways that we've tried to visualize the data. This is called a heat map, which one of the really neat things about D3 is it has a whole bunch of different plugins. Uh, this one's a big download, but it, uh, it gives you a way to kind of quickly visualize kind of sizes of things. And this is showing different message types and the percentage of those message types. And I think, well, now I'm going to remember because I've replaced everything with errors. Those are facilities. Um, so yeah, you can, the percentage of unreconciled messages is can kind of get a look at. And then you can drill into one where you've got a hot spot and see that you know, we're losing 94% of the messages that people work out for that data type. Which is, um, um, D3 is really good at doing different kinds of transition stuff. Um, so it's not something that I didn't actually do this one when my car first did, but it's. Uh, it's really fun to play with for doing that kind of stuff, just for eye candy. 
Um, this right here allows us to jump to different sites. I was talking about the Cloverleaf integration system earlier. That's what does our point-to-point -point work. So this right here is a view of Cloverleaf has what it calls threads, which are those point-to-point -point connections. And this is one section of our system, and we've got about 30,000 threads that are up right now, and then like we've got different thread states. You can see we've got 15 that are currently down, about 2,000 are opening or in transitional states at any given time. But this lets us kind of monitor everything en masse. Um, as you can see, we're generating tons of errors, which would be great to get rid of. And down here, these are message queues. Like this would get really big and start backing up if things were going terribly. We have different types of latency that can affect that system. And there are lots of people who are managing, like for, they're not exactly programmers, but they're kind of like implementers who go in and configure point-to-point -point connections. And so they're releasing builds. And so we can go in and see like different builds and who's releasing them at different times and try and find out, you know, if uh, you know someone's responsible for something we see happening. And we've got different alerts which we can use to uh, try and no, yeah, that's not interesting. Go to we can sort over here like state eleven's backed up messages and jump into a specific site. See, this is the state 11 messages. So we've got on this specific site 10,000 <coughs> messages have backed up. So this is another NFD3 diagnostic tool. And this down here is called a brush, which is basically a built in feature of D3. Um, and this little chart over here, and that's another thing that's awesome about the D3 libraries zillions of examples, I believe. This sortable uh, system to find different stuff, I ended up stealing from one of the D3 Les Miserables examples where they have the different characters and the relationships defined in a grid. Um, did you find you, that you had to do uh, any special optimizations for, I mean, you're obviously displaying a large amount of data there. Mm -hmm. Did you have to do anything special to get that amount of data up on the screen? Um, on the screen, no. On the database, the database stuff was actually, I think, much harder than okay. the screen stuff because it's, uh, uh, you know, this is getting up to 12,000 inserts per second at some times, and it's terabytes and terabytes of data. So, so you do a lot of your data management offline, I mean, on, yep. in the back end, so yes. that you can present Quickly, yeah, the data on the screen here. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I've done other sites where I got, <clears throat> where we would at least get partial aggregates of the data and then have that delivered and then do, and I'd like to do that because if you can do that, then on the client you can make things really, really snappy. But, and there's a great library that uh, works with D3 called Cross, Cross Filter, yes, yeah, um, which is pretty cool to play with. It'll do that kind of work with partial aggregates, but um, in this instance, I think we've got some stuff that does it, but uh, a lot of this stuff is just reliant on the server doing massive amounts of work. That makes sense. Do you feel like you had any trouble with code organization with having such a large amount of embedded uh, charts and graphs? Well, how did you go about uh, hierarching your, your uh, uh, directory yeah. and that sort of thing? Um, so, this is a single page application um, with, you know, there's a D3 map. Uh, uh, single page app, and we had a bunch of subsites and just different stuff we wanted to put in it. And so, when we started the project, uh, they also wanted to eventually scale. So, encapsulating things so that we could have multiple teams working on that application at the same time was one of the most important things. Um, and so we took a look at the different front-end frameworks we could find that were out at the time. And this is a little more than a year and a half ago. Uh, so we looked seriously at 
angular ember and backbone marionette. Um, and the one that I would have gone with probably that was out at the time was React, except it just seemed a little too new to, yeah. and I'd had bad experiences with Facebook in the past, their APIs. <laughs> <laughs> so it would certainly be the best for performance, I think. What? It would be the best for performance. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it also, it went along as well with uh, my past development experience because I used to do a lot of work in video game type stuff and a lot of desktop uh, multimedia work. And so I was used to working in component and behavior based coding systems. Um, so a lot of the frameworks that were out for the web were not very similar to what I was used to or really preferred. So that's we ended up writing our own um, framework. And so that's this stuff is all, it's D3 pretty much unencumbered, but for the visualization parts, but the application structure is all uh, components that are uh, you know, written in their own framework, which we're hoping to open source at the November conference coming up. Uh, it's it's a little different than other frameworks. Uh, it's designed for encapsulation, and also one of the big things was uh, to work in disparate teams. You can't, if you want to do it well, we really didn't want to have to worry or know what the other teams were doing. We didn't want to have to have a build process or a compile process. We have to merge classes and libraries together. So everything in this is designed to lazy load um, modules. In fact, every every element is basically a component, and every piece is a component in a component in a component. So it's kind of all nested stuff. And in any place, you can basically hand off like a portion of the screen to someone and say, now you go make something in this framework, and they can just copy and paste it in, and it should just work. So, um, but it also means it doesn't have to download a lot to start either, which was a, a big plus for, I have a, a big performance issue from video gaming where everything has to go really, really fast. <laughs> so, um, let's see, there's any other stuff I really wanted to show, I wasn't allowed to show. Um, to, 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 we did some really cool work uh, creating uh, stuff with uh, emergency room uh, data to show, uh, have you seen, I guess you want the Knoxville, HCA has like 30 facilities or something ridiculous, you know, in the rest of Tennessee, but none here. Uh, but if you're driving down the interstate, you'll see billboards. They're like seven minutes in the yes. late time mm -hmm. and stuff. So there, there's been a big drive. What? Tanaba does that here. Oh, do, do they? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's been a big drive to like push that number as low as possible. So now it's considered like ten minutes is like too long. And so we have this map of the U.S. You can like see different divisions and markets and view all the wait times and all the statuses of all the hospitals that. We, that HCA runs in the US, which is about 200 something. And you can like drill in and then jump in and see graphs. And I wanted to really show that, but we don't have permission for that right now. Um, so one thing I did have as well was um, I was going to show you some basic D3. This is from a tooltip library that I read that I started, I've kind of got a stripped out, stripped down JS Fiddle. Um, it, has everyone here played with JS Fiddle before? Mm -hmm. So I can, I can send up these links after the, after this for people who don't have laptops. Um, but it'll let you basically go to this and you can edit the code and mess around with it and see what you think. This is just showing how in D3 you know, you could set up a whole bunch of little circles randomly. And what I've done is, at the top here, uh, I've just got some basic HTML, which is more or less, probably can't see that back there. It's, there we go. Um, so, 
it's just a single SVG tag um, sets up like with the height box aspect ratio, and then then what it does is this is like D3 has its own selection system, very similar <coughs> to jQuery, um, and that's what's one of the things one of the things that's really dangerous about D3 is that it looks so much like, the, uh, like jQuery, and you expect it to work just like jQuery, and it just does not work like jQuery, at least for parts. This part kind of does. We're basically saying, I want a selection of the ID in the DOM named SVG demo. So it grabs that, basically, array of one. And then I can basically say, just like in jQuery, I'm going to take that selection, and append G. If you're not familiar with SVG, it's basically just like HTML. It adds like half a dozen new tags. Uh, G is group, and it's got things like circle and rect, line. And so it's mostly if you're just drawing pretty pictures and fills. Uh, so basically, for a lot of the stuff I do, I find it really useful to uh, create, add groups onto my SVG to make layers. That way I can kind of layer how everything is arranged. A lot of people that do D3 don't do that, but for me it's easier. Then D3 has a whole bunch of like really fun utility functions. So it's kind of like once you import it, you get maybe a lot of the things that something like underscore or lodash would give you, but you can just use D3 as well. Um, so if I do like dot range 150, it basically gives me a wrapped array of 150. I can reverse that and then call map, which is like a typical uh, functional map reduce style thing. So map I basically call a function on every element in the array and return a new array composed of the return values. So basically, I'm going to end up passing the numbers 1 through 150, or 0 through 149, I don't remember which, um, through this. And basically creating new objects right there, just giving each, uh, each one a, a name, just the number, and then I can set up hues, radius, circle x, circle y position. I don't know why I decided to do that instead of just x and y, because other stuff is x and y. And then alpha transparency. <coughs> so I turn that into there. Does anyone have any questions on that? Yeah, I have a question about the chaining. Uh -huh. um, what do you feel like is the biggest advantage of that? Do you, is it for timing um, animations and that sort of thing, and kind of a getting in the flow of this happens and this happens and then this happens, or um, readability or what? To 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 using method chaining, yeah. just in general, or for the purpose of D three. Um, I mean, I think it, it's often used just to be concise, and a lot of the, a lot of uh, the methods that you'd want to break on, like typically you might want something on multiple lines when you're programming in an imperative style, because you know you could have a bug in any one of those statements, and you might want to do a breakpoint or check the values or see what's going on. But in general, because it's usually acting declaratively in the chains for the most part, what ends up happening is it's, a lot of the D3 stuff doesn't do anything when you write it out. Like Stuff gets called and evaluated later. Um, so it's more like you're kind of setting up a roadmap. That's not the case here. This really is um, just manipulating an array. Uh, it's, I, I, I like method chaining, I guess, to some extent, it's, you know, personal preference. Uh, it goes really well with just, I think it's taken from a lot of the more functional languages. Um, is there a particular design pattern that D3 likes to play with? Because um, I know that you kind of created 150 array and then did stuff with the array as right. compared to... Method chaining is huge. Another thing that's huge are configurable functions, which 
I mean, J, if you've messed around in jQuery, that's basically what jQuery is. It's a function and an object, and you know you can call it or do things on it, but like you can configure the way the function is going to run. And uh, D three has a lot of things like you can set up a scale or an axis, and you know it acts as both a function that's going to create these things, but also a function that you can pretty much chain a bunch of uh, properties onto it or function callbacks that will work with other things to eventually resolve into how your axis will behave. And that can be really powerful because you can say, you know, this axis varies as a function and as that function changes later, if it re-renders, it gets, you know, remade. And so a lot of the code becomes not obvious and that's kind of hard and really painful to debug. But, um, <laughs> And I mean, literally, starting with D three is really painful. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, it, yeah, that's something that I've kind of noticed with D three is it kind of takes an atypical kind of chain, 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 and it, and it kind of come, becomes very intimidating to look at um, right. from an outside perspective. That's someone that's never messed with D three. It's more painful when you just can't figure out why nothing happens. <laughs> just nothing. There's no console error. Just nothing. So, so here what. Well, this is just creating 150 of these little objects, I'm doing it kind of in a D3 way. Then what, as I mentioned right at the start of the talk, D3 is all about creating these selections where we take a whole bunch of like DOM elements, and you can do it with SVG, you can do it with HTML, you can do it with pretend objects, but it, we, we have to zip together the, the DOM objects and the a data array and we might not have matches for everything. And so if it doesn't find them, the selection creates placeholders that we can operate on, which is kind of what makes it interesting. And there are three basic kind of selections. This first one right there uh, selects all circles, and that means, you'll see it's node layer, select all circles. The node layer, again, is this group. So select all says, I want to grab all of the circle DOM elements in my SVG. There, there's actually a circle tag. And then the, we don't actually have any right now. And then we're gonna marry those up to an array of node data that we just created, so 150 nodes. And that's called the update selection, when you just combine the, the selection with the data. And in this instance, we don't have anything that would show up on the screen because there's nothing, there, there are no pictures to update. So there are two other important selections. One is called enter, which you get by calling enter on the selection as a function, and the other is exit. So enter is the selection when you consider everything that needs to be created. It's basically going to give you a selection that represents all of those placeholders that need to be made. And so exit, the reverse, is everything where we've got DOM elements and the data that was bound to them is gone. And so that's everything you want to take away from the screen. And you have to manually do that, which is what kind of deviates from the functional aspect. So now it does do the thing where like operations on a selection, this is 150 circles, when we do append circle, it basically does 150 appends. It's going to create all of those circles as one selection. And then it applies this stuff on every single one of them. So we'll set the name. And notice it's a. Uh, oops. Let's bring this up. Um, there's the name. You see here it's function D. This is kind of the, the standard D3 way of doing things is it always passes, uh, if you, it always passes the function reference D, which is the current data. And then there's a second argument that I'm not using, comma I, which would be the index or key if you're using key data. Um, and so there, right there, it just grabs the name off the object, the X, Circle X position, circle Y position, radius, just all the properties that we created up on our data earlier. 
And then some we actually do a little more stuff to, like fills uh, to make colors. D3 supports a wide variety of color formats. Here, rather than RGB, which is not very human oriented, um, I used HSL, hue saturation lightness. So I can just give it a hue value, which is like 0 to 360, like a full circle of color hues. And then basically say how saturated it is and how, how much on the way to white, or basically lightness from white to black. And it makes it really easy to create colors that are a little easier to rock. Um, and then strokes and opacity. And this Why is the stroke reduction? What? Why is the stroke reduction? All the others. Oh, the stroke width right here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, this one right here? It can be. Um, and this is what, when I, the first slide back here, when I pass in one, it ends up going here into, this is what it does with it. So this is a good question to ask. So it puts the one in here and it automatically says one's not a function. So I'm going to translate your one into function return one, <laughs> which seems like a lot of overhead and it is kind of a lot of overhead. But it's that kind of wrapper stuff that made the <coughs> code base simpler because they could always view everything we've got as a function. Mm. And so and so this one when it runs, it just creates all of these little circles. And the full version, a different one I've got is and this is a, this one represents what's actually on my little tooltip um, site right now, but it basically partitions those circles up into. Um, oh, it's using target. You can see the tooltip's kind of jumping around based on the size of the circle. That's because it's it's actually positioning itself relative to the circles. But uh, it's finding out what circle you've selected by slicing the space up, giving each point its own like kind of area using a, a, what's called a Voronoi diagram, uh, which is a pretty nice, cool feature that's built into D3. Uh, you can see the shape. This is all, it ends up modifying it. So I just added a new layer, the Voronoi layer, to get those cells. And then if we go down, D3 has like all kinds of different geometries it supports. So I say I want a Voronoi geometry, and I can basically, I'm going to end up feeding it data where it's going to pull its x's and y's from the cx and cy we gave the circles. And I had to define clip extent, which is just the box. And then I can basically, you'll see this right here is a function that's been configured. And so I actually call it to basically get a population of uh, data that's been built into foreign data nodes. And then um, this one's a little more involved than you probably want to go through. But basically sets up something where I can make a tooltip and eventually uh, the, the Voronoi selection is really similar. It's like I've got Voronoi data, I, it got generated by the geometry and I have new data all append path which is like a line segment that's point to point and then for each of those paths I end up making a tooltip and formatting it, doing mouse over and mouse out events, uh, and then I've got a little click function that turns that foreign stuff on and off. And then here, ooh, oops, uh, er, this is the update. Like without an enter, it'll still affect everything that's on the screen. And I just say the path data is equal to a whole bunch of SVG stuff that gets created. Um, it's, it's something 
if you want to play with it, it's, it's something you could totally do later, I think. Uh, so can I say something about the, the, the data uh, syncing up? There's yeah. actually there's actually four stage you can deal with. Well, the update and the enter. If, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. when you when you have you have your set of DOM elements and you have your set of data elements, they're both basically arrays. So you obviously think about all those permutations. You have you have DOM elements that already exist in the, your data elements, and that's your initial select statement. So anything that matches up. You can do something to it, you can flash it, whatever. Then you have your enter uh, selection, and you can actually do, this is, this is adding the DOM elements that don't exist yet. You can add whatever DOM elements you want. And then, and then the nice thing is that the next select is the select that gives you everything that's present already. So that includes everything that just entered, plus everything that already existed. And so now you can do something with that whole set of things. And then the final one is like you were saying, the exit, the exit slide. So you can like have something slide out or whatever you want right. to do there. Yeah. Yeah. And you can also save references to some of those selections earlier and sometimes reuse them to like yeah. add more and more and more and more stuff on. So yeah, it's I mean you can do some really interesting things. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, there's uh, there are a number of free books that have come out too. You can find that online with D3 tips and tricks, and I think some of them's, uh, and there's a dashing D3 newsletter you can subscribe to if you're interested. <laughs> um, but this right here, uh, that tooltip thing, it's a little tooltip library that I've got, I'll send the link out, but it's just on my, my GitHub uh, page, and it also has, if you're interested in functional programming, um, you can also, this one doesn't have all the page stuff. You can also go see Catbus, which is the functional library that I'm putting together. This is what powers the, the single page app you were looking at before. The, not the whole framework, but this is a library that you can use. It's kind of like Bacon.js, if you're familiar with that, um, in that, or RxJS. It's, it's basically got, uh, which a reactive data flow and it acts as like a pub sub and a data store and you can do like filters and transformations on your data. And this one actually has all the API, so you can actually work through it, but it doesn't have a lot of good examples yet. No. Yeah, which is sad. So I'm still I'm writing a ton of documentation currently. That's really depressing. Um, uh, any questions or comments? Cool. Thank you very much for. Thank you.